So welcome to the first uh, faculty seminar uh, that will be broadcast to YouTube. Uh, my name is Omar Zaki. I'm the faculty seminar chair for the Yale Undergraduate Society for the Biological Sciences. Uh, the intent of these le lectures is to provide the greater community as well as the Yale community with uh, you know, a lecture from a highly reputable uh, source of biological research. I have to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first person we have speaking in, uh, for this series of lectures is uh, Don Engelman. And uh, Don Engelman, uh, Professor Engelman is a uh, professor here in molecular uh, biophysics and biochemistry, it's a mouthful, and BMB. Um, that's also what where my own department is for my bachelor's degree. Um, he actually advised, he was the undergraduate advisor for my advisor now, Jim Rothman. So, uh, so I mean, he's still doing great work uh, since that time. Um, and he primarily focuses on using peptides to, uh, he's involved in research that uses peptides to try to obviously destroy tumors and treat cancer. And so this is what his discussion will be uh, primarily focusing on today. And the official title of the lecture is Giving Tumors Acid Indigestion. <laughs> so hope, hope you will uh, enjoy this. And please stay tuned for uh, the other lectures we will have. There will be a whole series of whole different variety of faculty from uh, different uh, subspecialties in the biological sciences. So thank you very much. Professor Anker. Thanks, Omar. So how many of you pay taxes? <laughs> Show of hands. <laughs> Okay, how many of you are completely happy with everything that's done with the money? <laughs> no hands. <laughs> well, one thing that's really good about paying taxes, not so much about paying them, but one thing that's good that's done with the money is to fund basic scientific research that is health-oriented or technology-oriented for the benefit of society. And many years ago, the National Institutes of Health was set up as a basic way to approach health using fundamental science. And in particular, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences funds basic biological work, and the hope is that that work will result in advances that, are, that turn out to be useful for health and other applications. So the story I'm about to tell you is a vindication of the taxes you paid that went to buy research through the National Institute of General Medical Sciences and it resulted in something that we hope is going to be useful. So thank you. <laughs> now how many of you intend to get cancer? Oh, nobody. What a surprise. But probably many will because actually it's a disease that you get if you get old. And one way to avoid getting cancer is not to get old, but that's not a very good answer. Um, so cancer is with us and we are, as a community of scholars and medical scientists, always on the lookout for ways to treat, prevent, and uh, generally improve the lives of people with tumors. So I'm a biophysicist. I find myself in a very unusual circumstance being suddenly a health scientist and not a basic scientist. But the biophysicist in me comes out nonetheless. For example, this is a cell. <laughs> um, you may not recognize it, it's a humble version of a cell. But what it's intended to illustrate is the process, is that cell division is a process that we learn about um, in basic biology that, that allows us to develop from single cells into the organisms that we are. And um, there's a whole host of stories concerned with this process. Under normal, normal circumstances, cell division 
is under very tight control. And it it's, has to be. Cells have to be regulated not only in different tissues, but in response to injuries, in response to different demands from the environment. And all of this comes under the heading of the control of cell division. And if it's normal, uh, this is a very regular event. Cells in your, uh, in your skin divide pretty rapidly because you have to replace it all the time. Um, cells in other things, in your bones, much more slowly, um, and so on. If there's no control, then what happens is cell division goes on unabated and it just goes crazy, big arrow, lots of cell division, and you wind up with a tumor. Um, and if you're unlucky, it spreads. So, oops. So, one of the controls, one of the key sets of controls for cell division is a group of proteins called tumor suppressors. And they're called tumor suppressors because that was how they were originally found. They were originally found to be the proteins that suppressed the appearance of tumors because they were regulating cell division. Um, no tumor suppressors, you wind up with a tumor. Um, and today's story is about a molecule uh, called a microRNA, small RNA molecule, 23 bases long, that is responsible in some tumors for suppressing the expression of the tumor suppressor. So it prevents the tumor suppressor from being made, and that then results in a tumor. So this microRNA is one of the control elements that we would like to address somehow. Uh, another thread in the story is that tumors are acidic. Tumors are acidic for a, a variety of reasons. I'll mention a few of them later on. But the current ideas about targeted therapy for tumors have to do with things that are on the surfaces of the tumor cells that can be targeted. We call these biomarkers for the tumors. Um, and we make antibodies or different kinds of drugs that bind to these markers and attack the tumor cells. But the problem is that real tumors in, uh, in people are quite heterogeneous. And the heterogeneity of the tumor gives rise to populations that don't express the biomarker you're targeting. And so, for example, with an antibody treatment like her Herceptin, which you may have heard of for breast tumors, what happens is that you treat the tumor, the tumor goes away, everybody's happy, and then in a few months it comes right back again and is resistant. And it's because of the growth of these cells that are not expressing the marker. So what we're suggesting is a completely new approach in which we target acidity, the fact that the tumors are acidic. And why is this useful? I'm going to try to keep track of the time here. Um, it's useful because the uh, acidity arises from the fact that the cells are growing like crazy and their rapid growth generates acidity in their immediate environment metabolically. So what happens? Well, if you have cells that are not acidic, they're not growing, and they're not tumors. So acidity as a target is a very interesting thing to think about. It's been known for decades, but there's been no way to do it. So what we have is we have a tumor cell it's got a microRNA in it that's causing the uncontrolled growth. Um, and it's acid. And it secretes acid into the environment. And what we have a way to create a missile. Uh, and that missile seeks out the acidity. I'm so proud of this. 
See, see that? All right, we'll, let, we'll see it again. <laughs> Here we go. Seeks out the acidity. <laughs> um, and um, it releases a warhead that goes and hits the microRNA. Doesn't actually explode it. Um, and then, um, and, and so that is the basis of what I'm going to tell you about today. So we have cell division. We have a microRNA. We want to knock out the microRNA. And if we knock out the microRNA, the tumor suppressor is expressed. Uh, cell division s slows down, and tumor cells are all kind of whacked out metabolically. So when this happens, they die. A good answer. So going for a level, a membrane, a biological membrane, we'll talk some more about it, is represented here by the main structure it, it, that builds it. It's called a lipid bilayer. So it's a two layers of lipid molecules that make this very thin liquid-like sheet that sort of makes the boundary layer of cells. And we have a peptide that we call FLIP. Um, talk more about that, too. That is the missile. Um, this, I've learned, is a mouse. Uh, never had to think about anything that I could see in my research before, but here we are. Uh, I've learned a lot about it. This is the front end of the mouse. This is the back end. <laughs> this particular mouse has a tumor, and, and if, we make, if we put a fluorescent label on this um, on this missile, what we find is that it goes around and finds the tumor. So this is one of the first original observations that led to the, the work that we're doing now. Nuanced view of a cell. And it's got a lot of membranes in it all over the place. And the, but the main one that we're concerned about is the outside membrane, the plasma membrane that separates the cell from its environment. So if you're going to give a treatment, it's got to be able to find it, what it sees is the outside of the cell and the environment. So what we want to do is find the, the cell by the acidity and, and poke into uh, and across this membrane, this very thin uh, liquid barrier that uh, I spent a lot of years studying. So um, uh, we know a lot more about it now. Uh, it's basically simple. As I say, it's got these two lipid layers. And this inside part here is very greasy. And so that keeps um, molecules that are soluble in water don't go through this very well. And so when you make drugs, normally you try to you start with a lead compound. And then you try to make them more and more greasy so that they can go across this barrier and into a cell and have some activity. Um, so there are lots and lots of functions for membranes, but it's really the outer one. Now, this is a little review <laughs> of the central dogma of molecular biology. What you're looking at is the main biology of the last half of the 20th century, in which information is coded in DNA. You make copies into RNA molecules that then code, most of them, code for making proteins. And then the proteins are made as a long string of amino acids called a polypeptide. And then that has to fold up to make a functional protein. And we were studying this, this step, basically, for membrane proteins. How do they fold to make a functional object? So the protein folding problem for membrane proteins mostly looks like this. Membrane proteins are very often, these are proteins that go across, this is a schematic of that lipid bilayer thing, go across the lipid bilayer, and they do it using these helical stretches 
which are coiled up versions of the amino acids in, the, in, the, in that polypeptide. So I'm going to talk about how studies of membrane protein folding led to the discovery of the peptide. That's the missile. I'm going to show a few studies in cells that show what it can do. And then I'm going to show targeting and delivery of an anti-tumor agent to treat a cancer in a mouse. So first, my colleagues and I had a lot of ideas about how protein folding might work in membranes. And the simplest version of it is that you make these helices first. There are a bunch of arguments about this. But the idea was that these individual pieces, the helices that bundle up to make that membrane protein, are individually formed and stable. So they're stable one at a time. And then in a membrane, they interact to make the functional protein. And then it turns out there are a lot more steps. But this, this is the initial beginning of membrane protein folding, and it still is, I, I think, the main way that people think about it. So if you were studying this, what would you do? Well, we spent a lot of time studying how helices interact with each other. And we found out a bunch of stuff. Um, and we published a lot of papers, and we got a lot of your tax money. <laughs> Um, and, but another piece was to say, okay, well, if the, if the premise is that these things are stable one at a time, why don't we take a protein, cut it up into all of its pieces where each piece is one of these, and see if it makes a stable separate thing. That's a prediction of the, of the idea. So here's a schematic. This is the lipid that's going to make the membrane. This is the protein, the peptide. We mix these things together with magic potions and things. And lo and behold, we make a membrane, and we study it. And there's a transmembrane helix. And we say, great, and move on to the next one. When we got to the third helix in this, in this protein we chose to study, uh, John Hunt came to me graduate student, now a professor at Columbia, um, came to me and said, you know, I, I've got the weirdest thing. This, I mixed, I did this. But what I found was that a lot of the peptide was just free in solution, not, where, not what you expect. It should have been, it's kind of a little bit greasy. It should have been this, but it was that. So we looked at the sequence, and this the sequence being the arrangement of the amino acids along the chain. And two of them that would be in the middle, where the, they'd be inside the membrane, were, uh, had acid groups on them. The acid groups um, suggested that we should change the pH. And so what John did was to lower the pH, and he found that it inserted into the membrane and made this transmembrane helix. And he raised the pH, and it came out again. And so this was the discovery. Well, we weren't looking for this. You weren't paying me through your tax dollars in the NIH to look for this. What we were studying was folding, how the basic biology works, how the information in DNA makes membrane proteins, and all of that. But what we found was this thing with this very unusual set of properties. So we followed it up. Low pH, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be too technical. Low pH is what that means is it's acid. Um, and normal pH would be the pH of your blood. PH, slightly basic at pH 7.4, typically. Um, and we named these things. Now, this is where we get to play. Uh, so we call them pH, for the acidity, right? Low, 
insertion peptides, or FLIPS. Um, and this is now, the, you notice it's a registered trademark, <laughs> so you can't copy it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what a FLIP does is, as I mentioned earlier, it's soluble in water, it binds, it turns out to the surfaces of membranes at, and at, so it's soluble in water and it's kind of a floppy, disorganized thing. Um, it binds to the surface of a membrane, still pretty floppy, extended, not very well organized, and then at low pH, when the acidi acidity gets high enough, uh, it inserts, a, it first forms the helix, so it organizes itself on the surface, and then it inserts across. And it inserts across in one direction with, a, with its carboxy terminus at one end, and that's important to know that it's a separate insertion event. No, so, for a while, I couldn't get anyone in the lab to work on this. It was really kind of a curiosity. You know, we, we published a couple papers, and we thought it was really interesting. It gave us some insights into how peptides go into membranes. And then, two colleagues, now still my colleagues, joined the lab, at, one as a postdoc and one as a visitor. Um, and, and they knew about cancer, and they knew that tumors are acidic. Why are they acidic? This gets a little technical. Uh, they, when cells don't have enough oxygen, they, their metabolism changes in a way that causes them to make acid, acid groups inside, their, inside the cell. The cell regulates that by pumping it out. So that makes acidity around the cell. The cell inside is still at normal pH. There's another effect. Cancer cells are growing like crazy, and they're taking in sugar a lot. And they take in glucose so much that their metabolism can't keep up with it. And once again, they get overwhelmed, and they make, uh, they use this process called glycolysis that makes, makes acidity. The cells have to pump out the acidity to maintain themselves, and so the environment gets acidic. Um, part of the metabolism is you make a lot of CO2, respiratory, just as you breathe in oxygen and you breathe out CO2, your respiration makes CO2. So, so the cells make enzymes to process the CO2, and that makes more acidity. And it turns out that the surface, the very close to the surface of a cell, is even more acidic than the bulk. So all of these things contribute to the fact that something like FLIP, that has the capacity to sense the surface acidity, um, is a, an interesting um, thing to explore. So remember I said that it's the C-terminus, this, this peptide has a direction. The C-terminus um, that is inserted. So we make something using a bond, and it's called a disulfide, two sulfur atoms. We make that bond to X. And X might be any kind of cargo that we want to deliver into the cell. Uh, the environment, if the environment is acidic, then it inserts, and we take this cargo into the cell. Uh, this bond is stable out here, but it's not stable inside the cell. And so it gets cleaved, and we've delivered X into the cell. And we, we've spent a lot of time studying what these Xs might be. Uh, what we know is that relatively large, compared with drugs, relatively water-soluble compared with drugs, uh, cargos can be delivered. And so it then 
begs the question, well, what can we deliver? And so now we're down to the warheads. So the flip is the missile, senses the acidity, inserts across that membrane into the cell in one direction. And uh, we, have, we have some activity to deliver approved drugs. There's a kind of tricky, tricky business there because they go in on their own, so you're really using the flip in that case to prevent them from going in where you don't want them. So this is a way to improve drugs so that you reduce side effects. Um, toxins, molecules that we could deliver that would just kill the cell, dead. Um, and not the one that we're most interested in are these non-drug-like poleactive molecules. And I'm going to tell you about one, but there are lots. Pharmaceutical companies have tons of these uh, that they have found over the years. It's all secrets. Uh, nobody knows what they are because they are drug development projects where they did the, this, you've heard of screening for drugs, you know, they take a whole lot of, a whole lot of compounds and throw them at the, at the target and they find some that are active, but they aren't drugs. They don't get into cells, so then they spend a lot of time trying to keep the activity while uh, trying to make it into a, a drug. A lot of those, a lot of those development efforts just stop because they can't get any further and make it into a drug without losing the activity. But they've got all those other compounds. What if we could deliver those? That's a whole universe of active compounds for all kinds of diseases that are not yet uh, useful. So one of our dreams is to make those useful, at least in the context of cancer. Um, so, I already mentioned microRNAs as being um, elevated in tumors. Some specific ones are elevated in tumors. Um, microRNA 155, so we call these oncomeres for the microRNAs that cause tumor, that are oncogenic or tumor causing. MicroRNA 155 in a mouse model of lymphoma suppresses the expression of tumor suppressors. Uh, it, so remember, the, remember what it does is it, the tumor suppressor is controlling the growth. You suppress the expression of the tumor suppressor. Now there's no tumor suppressor, so no growth control. Um, and in, in experiments outside animals, you can use a complementary molecule of RNA that mi mimics the sequence of this and shut it down and then you trigger cell death, but you can't use this kind of complementary RNA in an animal, whether it's a mouse or a person. So, what we want to do is to suppress the suppression of the expression of tumor suppressors. Got it? That'll be on the exam. <laughs> um, and so, we're up against a barrier normally because we can't deliver RNA to cells in vivo. So we use a version, another chemical version of RNA, the PNA, that I'll tell you about. Acid. So, um, and it has the bases on it that are associated with DNA and RNA that make the base pairs and the double-stranded structures that you've seen a million times. Um, but, uh, and, and it's the information is in the sequence of these bases. And if you have a complementary sequence on an RNA molecule, the, this pairs up and it makes a very tight complex that will inactivate this RNA. So if this is a micro RNA, we make a long piece, 23 of these bases long with the right sequence, and we can inactivate the micro RNA. But peptide nucleic acid is still cell imp impermeable. So the question obviously is, can we target it and deliver it with FLIP? Um, 
for those of you who uh, are thinking about this chemically, um, the, poly, the RNA molecule has a lot of charges on it, these phosphate groups. And that's why it won't go into cells, and it's too big a barrier to deliver it with FLIP. Can't do it. The peptide nucleic acid has this different kind of structure in the backbone. It's still polar, but it doesn't have charges. And so that's a very big difference. And it makes a tight complex because there's no charge repulsion between the backbones. Um, so if you want to have a, a precise complex, you have, a, you have a sequence that's complementary to the sequence on the RNA. Or in some of our control experiments, what we do is we randomize the sequence on the PNA so that it is not complementary and we don't expect it to work. So that's a kind of important control that we have. We're back to the cell again. So we have a, we have a, I'm going to show you the key experiment for delivering a peptide nucleic acid into, uh, into a cell. Um, so we have our missile, um, we have a test cell, and we have a fluorescent label on the warhead. So we add activity. This is now a peptide nucleic acid with a fluorescent label on it. And we deliver it. Um, it comes apart, so this would, if it gets into the cell, it would release the peptide nucleic acid, and this would be fluorescent, so we'd see a fluorescent cell. Uh, and then we wash, wash out the acidity, and that gets rid of the flip part. So all we're left with is a, is a cell with fluorescence in it, if it worked. So here we go. What we're going to do is we make this flip, the disulfide, remember that's the link that can get cleaved, the peptide nucleic acid, and a fluorescent group called Tamra or rhodamine. And we bind it to cells at pH 7.4, where we don't expect it to insert. And then we wash it, and we expect it to just get washed off. If we bind it to cells at pH 6.2, we expect it to insert. The disulfide gets cleaved, leaves this piece behind, and we wash out the flip. What this actually looks like is shown here. So here are cells that have been incubated at pH 7.4 and washed at pH with this flip construct, this thing, um, and washed at pH 7.4. Not much there. In fact, you have to trust me that there's anything there. If instead we incubate at pH 6.5 and wash at pH 7.4, now there's fluorescence inside the cells, and that tells us that we were able to deliver the peptide nucleic acid. So this is the proof that this whole thing works. We have a missile targeted by acidity, it inserts across the membrane, it delivers a peptide nucleic acid that's going to be complementary to the microRNA and we hope will shut down the expression, shut down the suppression of the expression of tumor suppressors. I have to, I have to practice that. Um, and, and, and here it is. We're going to, we find that um, really we can deliver pretty undrug-like things, including these peptide nucleic acids. So we've, we've looked at a lot of different agents like this. So now we're going to the final, the final piece here. Um, we often use mouse models. I say we as if I do this. I don't do this. Uh, uh, my colleagues do this. Uh, to study delivery of an anti-tumor agent. Uh, Frank Slack, uh, together with Chris Cheng, uh, developed a mouse model for lymphoma, I already mentioned it, in which uh, microRNA controls the growth of the lymphoma. So these mice, uh, you 
you basically grow them up, uh, and after a few months of growth, they develop lymphoma. It's disseminated, it's all over them, and there are other models you can derive from that, but we're just going to talk about this one. And very cleverly, they put in a switch. And the switch is controlled by an antibiotic. So if you add the antibiotic, you shut down this microRNA. You can just feed the mouse the antibiotic, and um, it gets, in this case, it's doxycycline. Doesn't have to, anything to do with the fact that it's an antibiotic. Um, it's just used to throw this switch. So this is really clever stuff, and I, I could never do this. But these guys, Frank, <clears throat> really clever, Chris Chang, Erwin Babar, really good. And here's what the model system looks like. So here's the mouse, sad thing, just bulbous with lymphoma. Um, and uh, you add doxycycline, and in 48 hours, it's almost normal. It's really amazing how, that, how it gets shut down. So this is under control of that microRNA that's controlling the expression of the tumor suppressor. We've shut down the microRNA. The tumor suppressors are active. The cells, die, the cells in the tumors die, and the mouse is much happier. What about our missile? What we make is the flip, the disulfide that's going to get cleaved inside the cells, the peptide nucleic acid, that's the, that's the weapon, uh, and we put a fluorescent group on it so that we can follow it. Uh, and what we hope is that it will get inserted by acidity in the tumor, but not in other cells. Um, the disulfide will break and release the peptide nucleic acid, which will bind to and inactivate the microRNA, and that will uh, raise the uh, level of tumor suppressors, and the tumors will die. So that's a lot to hope for. Oh, there's something else we hope. It's not toxic. It would be good if the mouse didn't drop dead when we inject this. But we're injecting it into the blood, not into the tumor or anything, so it's going around the blood, and it actually turns out we can inject it just into the belly, and it goes around and finds it a little more slowly. So here's our missile, guided by acidity. Here's our weapon. So in cultured cells, what we find is that incubating it, these are cells now cultured from this mouse lymphoma, um, what, we, what we see is a very strong signal triggered by acidity, but not at normal pH. And this is the expression of the tumor suppressor. So in cells, we show that the tumor suppressor is elevated. Uh, this is without any PNA, and this is the scrambled version. Remember, I mentioned that there's a control. And so if we put in the scrambled version that doesn't match, it's a PNA that doesn't match the sequence of the microRNA. So it, we don't expect it to do anything, and it doesn't. So here's the mouse. Uh, it's got lymph adenopathy. Um, they're brown mice and white mice, don't get confused in this study. Um, here's our weapon, and so what we do is we let the mouse de develop lymphoma. We inject this a couple of times, um, t uh, day zero and day two, and then we see what happens. Uh, First of all, we can go into the tumors and actually ask what's happening biochemically. And what we find is these are a couple tumor suppressors, and what we find is they're elevated. So we have suppressed the suppression of the expression of tumor suppressors in these yeah. tissues. And the mouse. So here's the mouse before treatment, really in trouble. Um, and after 72 hours, it's basically normal looking. So we've injected, we have a new means to target tissues based on acidity that target 
tumors that deliver these peptide nucleic acids that can modulate the genetics. And there are other kinds of genetic modulations that we can do using the same tricks. Maybe fix mutations and things like that. Um, so there's a lot to this technology. But one of the things we can do is shut down these tumors. And it's a model system, and it's a long way before we actually get to treat people. But we are pretty excited. excited. So I have this little movie that I'll show you, uh, taken by Chris Cheng. Um, so this is a mouse with disseminated lymphoma. Uh, it has paresis. It can't move much. Uh, it's a very sad mouse. It looks a little scruffy. Um, very unresponsive. Turns out it's also incontinent and some other things. And ordinarily, if we had a mouse like this in the lab, we would euthanize it because it's in pain. It's really having, having trouble. This, you'll have to trust me, is the same mouse three days later after, after treatment. Which mouse would you rather be? So this is really an effort that involves a lot of people. Um, I've had some modest role in it, but really there are, there are tremendous prospects. Um, we have different things that we can target to tumors. I'm particularly excited by this one that we mentioned before, the things that are, this is a whole new pharmacology. Um, our, our immediate applications are probably going to be imaging applications where we assist surgeons in knowing where the tumor is to take it out. Um, there are other tumors, and we're working on metastatic melanoma in another line of work, um, and targeted drug delivery. And we're starting a company because the only way you can really bring something into medical practice and raise enough money to do this is to have a company. So we are now a company, Flip Inc. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we can't help ourselves. Um, uh, a bit whimsical, but it's a serious company. Um, the origins of the work were with the colleagues I mentioned. Andrea and Reshetniak, who, who now are at the University of Rhode Island, and we continue to work together. Hunt was the graduate student who was part of the original discovery. Um, the work that uh, has just appeared, actually, it took until 2015 to get out in print. Um, it's in Nature, February 5th issue, um, so just out. And uh, these are the authors. Um, I, I mentioned particularly Frank Slack, a really very important figure in this, and, uh, and Chris Chang, who's the first author of this paper. Um, and thanks particularly to all of you for your money. <laughs> Are we major capitalists? Yeah, you could say that. Un, unwitting, unwilling perhaps even. Um, but it's your tax money that funds basic research that every once in a while, if we're really lucky, turns up something new. And I feel so charged and lucky to be part of that kind of process. I think there's a 